Okay, guys, this is our uh, unit on civil rights. Uh, it's a very short unit, um, not because civil rights isn't important, because it is, but simply because it's only one topic. Uh, we're not looking at everything that happens in a particular decade. So uh, it's a very short unit, so a good time for you to uh, uh, make some hay here and do a good job on this test and help you grade out. So let's get started here with our first slide. Um, the beginning. We gotta start somewhere, so we start at the beginning. Um, and most early civil rights work, at least here in the uh, uh, in the fifties, um, deals with voter registration, because really the only way you're going to make any change in your uh, in your life is if you have some say uh, in the people that are making decisions for your life. Um, only about twenty percent of eligible uh, blacks in the South were registered to vote. 20%. Uh, and if you look at the deep south states, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, um, Louisiana, states like that, um, it's fewer than 5%. So uh, when you consider all the eligible black voters, fewer than 5% were even registered to vote, much less actually were able to vote. Uh, so the first thing civil rights workers have to do um, is get blacks registered to vote. Uh, so that they can have some say in their lives. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about, throughout this unit, different stories of uh, violence against blacks and so forth. Uh, and one of the more well-known ones uh, involves a young 14-year-old black boy named Emmett Till. Emmett Till. He was 14 years old, uh, lived in Mississippi, and in 1955, um, he was uh, beaten to death for allegedly leering or staring at a white woman uh, and whistling at her, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and because of supposedly doing that, he was beaten to death. Over here on the right, uh, you see a picture of young Emmett Till, a uh, 14-year-old boy. This is what he looked like in his casket. Uh, his mother insisted uh, that he have an open casket um, at his funeral because she wanted the world to see what was done to her little boy. Uh, he's beaten unrecognizable as Emmett Till, almost unrecognizable as a human, um, for nothing more than staring at or whistling at um, a white woman. Just recently, um, there was a, a, a story. The woman that he supposedly stared at and whistled at uh, admitted that he had never done that. He had never whistled at her, uh, but she hated blacks so much that uh, uh, she wanted to make an example of him. So Emmett Till uh, becomes an example uh, of what can happen to blacks in the South who cross uh, whites. Now, if you look at one of the more one of the high points here, at least, more successful uh, efforts of blacks to get things done early on. Uh, we have to talk about Brown versus Board of Education. This is a uh, Supreme Court case. takes place in May 1954 um, in Topeka, Kansas. This is Brown versus the Topeka, Kansas uh, Board of Education. Uh, and it's going to deal with segregation in public schools. Okay? Uh, a man named Oliver Brown uh, sues the Topeka Board of Education because his young daughter, um, who you see right here, uh, Linda Brown is her name, uh, was not able to go to a school just uh, a couple of blocks from her house. She had to travel several miles uh, walking to get there. Uh, and in order to get there, she had to walk through a railroad switching yard. So she had to cross railroad tracks um, and walk miles and miles to get to uh, the nearest black school. So Brown sues the Board of Education um, that she should be uh, allowed to attend uh, the school closer to her house. Okay. Now, a couple of names you're going to need to know here. Uh, the first one is a man named Thurgood Marshall. He will uh, be Oliver Brown's uh, attorney, his lawyer. Right? 
uh, Marshall will, this is where he first kind of makes a name for himself. He will go on later, uh, you might know the name, uh, to become the first black Supreme Court justice. Uh, but he is a lawyer for the NAACP, uh, the NAACP, uh, and they are representing Oliver Brown. Okay. Now, they're trying to overturn, uh, get the Supreme Court to overturn a previous Supreme Court ruling known as Plessy v. Ferguson. Now, if you'll think back to early on in the year, um, our first unit on Reconstruction, we talked about Plessy versus Ferguson, um, that rules separate but equal, that it's okay to have separate facilities for blacks and whites as long as they are equal. Well, Thurgood Marshall will argue very simply that it is impossible to have separate but equal facilities because by the very act of separating something, based on race, you are saying that they're not equal. If they were equal, there would be no reason to have two separate facilities. But because of the fact that you have to separate a facility based on race, you're saying that one race is superior to another. And the Supreme Court agrees. Supreme Court will overturn Plessy versus Ferguson and say that segregation in public schools is illegal. And this will lead to the end of segregation in public schools. But there's a problem with the Supreme Court ruling. The ruling includes the language that all schools must desegregate with all deliberate speed. Schools must desegregate with all deliberate speed. Now, the problem with that ruling is that that's a very vague term. Nobody knows what with all deliberate speed is. To a black man, that means they need to desegregate now. To a white man, it means we're going to take our own sweet time. And to give you an example of just how slow, um, again, this is 1954. Ten years after the Brown ruling, by 1964, less than 2% of schools in the South had been desegregated. In 10 years, the South had only managed to desegregate less than 2% of the schools. So clearly, they were in no hurry to integrate the schools, and nobody knew exactly what with all deliberate speed meant. So while blacks will win uh, a victory here with Brown versus Board of Education, um, it's not going to bring an immediate end to the problem. What does more to help these problems than anything else um, is not a, a court case. Uh, it's not schools. It's, it's nothing like that. Um, it's sports. And one man in particular, Jackie Robinson. Uh, Jackie Robinson became the first black man to play Major League Baseball. Um, blacks had played in the Negro Leagues for a long time, years and years and years, uh, but never had there been one in Major League Baseball. Well, the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers owner, a man named Branch Rickey, interesting name, Branch, uh, but Branch Rickey, owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, decides it is time for blacks to play Major League Baseball. So he chooses Jackie Robinson to be the man to break the color barrier in baseball. Uh, and it's not because Robinson is the best black baseball player around, because he's not. There are others better than him. Uh, he's an excellent ball player, really, 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 really good, extremely talented, but he's not the best. Uh, but he's what Branch Rickey needs. Rickey brings Robinson into his office and says, the Brooklyn Dodgers want to sign you to play Major League Baseball. And he said, Robinson says, why me? And he said, because I need somebody that's going to be strong enough not to fight back. Uh, because Robinson was going to undergo the worst possible treatment from whites um, in baseball, players and fans alike, especially when they traveled south to play uh, for spring training to begin with. But uh, Robinson will be yelled at, screamed at, called every name imaginable. He'll have baseballs thrown at his head. He'll get spiked. Um, he... I, 
and treatment from his own teammates is not much better until one teammate steps up and makes a difference. Um, a, uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers shortstop was a player by the name of Pee Wee Reese. And Pee Wee Reese is from Louisville. If you go down to Slugger Field downtown, uh, there's a statue of Pee Wee Reese in front of Slugger Field. Uh, Pee Wee Reese Road up there by Seneca Park, named after him. Um, but uh, Pee Wee Reese was one of the most respected members, uh, players in baseball. Not just on the Dodgers, but in all of baseball. And one day, it was in Cincinnati, uh, Robinson was about to give up. He'd had about all he could take, uh, and Pee Wee knew it. Um, and he walked over to Jackie Robinson before the game started while they were taking, uh, uh, the pitcher was warming up, they were taking infield. Um, he walks over to Robinson in front of a, a stadium full of people, his own teammates, the Reds, everybody, uh, and he puts his arm around Jackie Robinson standing at first base. Um, and that act alone did more to get Jackie Robinson accepted in baseball than anything else. For Pee Wee Reese to stand up publicly and say, look, this guy's okay, give him a break, um, will uh, we'll, we'll go a long way toward getting other players to accept Jackie Robinson. Um, and if you've not seen the movie 42, uh, you should watch that at some point. If you're interested in learning more about this, it's uh, a great movie. But uh, Jackie Robinson breaks baseball's color barrier.